something that has happened in the last couple of weeks is uh, uh, some people have renounced their faith. Wow. Some big people. In, uh, Joshua Harris renounced his faith, and then uh, uh, Marty Sampson, a Hillsong worship leader. Have you guys heard about this? No. Okay, well, anyway, they're like, I'm on shaky faith. I don't, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. And it's like, it's like we need to have an, you know, it's like, okay, what do we think about that? Well, they must have good reasons. I want to, I want to talk about that. Michael, you guys know who um, Michael Brown is? He's got a big old mustache, and he's a very smart guy. He wrote a letter, open letter. This is such a good letter. Because when somebody in a leadership position renounces their faith, we need, to ha- we need to have a response to that. It's like, what? What do I think about that? Because it's like, well, he must have had a good reason because like, he's in, in the church. He knows God. That's not a good reason. So I'm going to read this letter that Michael Brown wrote con- uh, concerning Marty Sampson, and I think it's fantastic. I think the whole church needs to consider this in in light of this what dr michael brown he's a radio host he's author he's written a lot of things he's very well known he's what he's been on sid roth yeah you can check him out he's amazing he writes some great stuff he says some great stuff so here this is this is his letter i just read the news that marty sampson a popular hillsong songwriter is leaving the faith in, him is, in his words, I'm genuinely losing my faith, and it doesn't bother me. You should turn this mic down a little bit. While some critics claim he was never a true believer, I know nothing about Marty at all, so I'll take him at his word that he did believe in the past, but does so no longer. What I find most surprising is not him turning from his faith. People fall away all the time, and there are warnings throughout the New Testament about the dangers of falling away from the faith. It's tragic to see, but not a total surprise. What is surprising is Marty seems to feel that no one is talking about challenges to the Christian faith. No one is discussing difficult intellectual issues. No one is engaging the apparent contradictions in the Bible. This is what Marty said. So, I can only ask, with sadness rather than condemnation, Marty, what Christian world have you been living in? Marty asks, how many preachers fall? Many. No one talks about it. Really? How many articles have been written in the last few weeks about the falling away of Joshua Harris, the pastor, author of the best-selling book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, which was a big deal in our youth group (laughs) back in the day. This is just the most recent example. And how many articles have been written by believers about sexual and financial scandals involving major Christian leaders? No one talks about it. Seriously? He writes, he writes, how many miracles happen? Not many. No one talks about it. To repeat my question, what Christian world is he living in? First, there are wonderful books. Just a few examples are The Case for Miracles by Lee Strobel, Miracles, How They Can Change Your Life by Eric Metaxas, Eyewitnesses to Miracles by Randy Clark. These are, there are way too many to list. These books document incredible contemporary miracles performed in the name of Jesus. Second, there are even more books dealing with the difficult questions of what to do when you don't receive your miracle. Plenty of times the expected miracles do not take place. My search for the words Christianity and the problem of suffering yielded almost one million results. Marty writes, why is the Bible full of contradiction? No one talks about it. Once again, I can't believe I'm reading these words. Doesn't almost every believer at one point or another ask about apparent contradictions in the Bible? Don't all of us one time or another try to find answers to these questions? Isn't that what we're doing all the time? In Bible study, we're talking about these these hard things of the Bible. That's That's what we spend all of our time doing in our men's Bible study. 
Huh. Doesn't almost every believer at one point or another ask about apparent contradictions in the Bible? Don't all of us at one time or another try to find answers to these questions? Again, not only are the, there are countless books that address these questions, but almost every major study Bible will tackle these questions as well. And what happens when you search for Bible contradictions with the word apologetics? You find thousands of websites offering different levels of answers to these apparent problems. Marty writes, how can God be love yet send four billion people to a place all because they don't believe? No one talks about it. At this point, I want to shout, of course we talk about it. I preach about it all the time. The problem of hell, the problem of people rejecting God, of God's obligation to, to bring justice if somebody wants to walk away from the house, God lets them walk away from the house. Anyway, <laughs> of course we talk about it. Of course we discuss the question of hell and future punishment. Of course we ask how a good God could condemn his own cre creation to eternal destruction. As for the notion that people go to hell all because they don't believe, I can only shake my head in amazement. Does Marty have no conception of human sin and rebellion? Do people perish simply because they didn't recite some kind of magic formula? He writes, I want genuine truth, not the I just believe it kind of truth. This is more of what Marty wrote. Science keeps piercing the truth of every religion. And here's the comment. Well, I'm thrilled to hear he wants genuine truth as opposed to simply taking things by faith. But I must ask once more, what Christian world has he been living in? Is it just me and the people I know who want genuine truth, who are willing to ask the hard questions, who actually encourage honest seeking? The answer is certainly not. There are countless millions who want more than just a simplistic, shut off your brain kind of faith. I am not seeking a shut off your brain kind of faith because I found if I will search, there are very satisfying answers to every question I ever had. Very, very satisfying answers. As for science, piercing the truth of every religion, I will simply say this, if Marty and I were standing next to a wall of solid academic Christian books responding to scientific challenges, and that wall of books collapsed, we would not survive the avalanche. Everybody has written on Christian scientific apologetics. He writes, all I know is what's true to me right now. Christianity just seems to me like another religion at this point. And this is even sadder. Has Marty not seen thousands of radically transformed lives through the gospel? Has he not heard the dramatic and moving testimonies of former Muslims and Hindus and others? Does he not see the cross shouting out to him from the depths of God's loving heart, something never found in any other religion on the planet? I have no idea if Marty is simply passing through a difficult stretch, but what I fear is that Marty's shocking lack of awareness of a massive array of solid ap apologetic material is not his alone. In other words, there are probably plenty of other people who find no outlet for their questions and concerns. This can lead to serious doubts rather than an intellectually sound and vibrant faith. We must not be afraid to ask honest questions and to diligently follow the truth where it leads. We will discover that he is the God of truth and his word is truth. Let's pray for Marty's repentance, restoration, and more. Dr. Michael Brown, August 12, 2019. That is a very, very good bunch of questions. Man, <laughs> I don't know about you, but something that we read First thing was evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. That some, we need to know why we believe what we believe. And apologetics, there's millions of things scientifically uh, directed that, that if you have questions like that, man, get the answers because they're out there. There's good reasons why we, the, this Bible is trustworthy. I, it's not just because I believe it. This Bible is actually the literal trans handed down, and there's reasons to know that that's the facts.
Jesus rose from the dead. Historically verifiable that Jesus rose from the dead. This all kinds of historical uh, facts that we can know about the Christian religion. Anyway, so it's so, so, so good. So I wanted to read that. Is that okay? Yeah. You guys good with that? Got a little emotional. <laughs> but it's, it's so good. All right, so I've been preaching the last few weeks about either the love of God or spiritual warfare. And then, because I have, I, I, I always think, I need to speak on spiritual warfare. And it's like, I want to speak, speak on the love of God, so I'll go back and forth. And then on the last few sessions, I realized that the Father's love is spiritual warfare, and boy, I got to hammer that because I'm talking about the love of God and spiritual warfare at the same time, right? <laughs> because the Father's love because, because if a kid comes in, I'm going to say this again. I don't care if you heard it every time. A kid comes in, he's all, he's all damaged. He's, he's, he's injured because somebody beat him up. He comes into the house. A man beat me up. One, one love goes and says, oh, baby, I love you. Here, have a cookie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, fix you. And the other love grabs a weapon and runs out the door. And we're like, oh, you don't even care. You don't even care. You don't even care that I'm hurt. You're running out the door. No, that's the love of God. That's the justice of God that has to take action. And we need to have that kind of love. There's times we need to have the love of the Father. And I think the end time revival is going to reveal the love of the Father more than it has maybe in the past. We'll see. It's going to be a love of God that's full full character of the love of God so uh uh-huh I'm going to talk about love tonight's the message is called proving love and the and we're going to get to Psalm 1 I mean Job 1 8 and 9 a lot later or a little later in the message but this is what we're going to base it on we're going to base it on uh prove how God proves love in us the fact that we you know um We love God because he first loved us. But we love God because he first loved us. We don't work for God because he first loved us. Sometimes we don't really know what response God's asking for. He's asking for a love response. Okay, so a guy takes a girl out to a a date. And and, and she's looking at the menu. And and the guy's guy's like... um, uh, you know, what are we going to, let's have a date. I want to have a date with you. I want to spend time with you. And the girl's like, look, I can't fall in love with you right now. I'm trying to figure out this menu. It's very complicated. Just leave me alone. <laughs> leave me alone. I gotta... The whole point of the encounter was that you'd fall in love. And we do that with our relationship with the, the Lord. It's like, Okay, God, God, just leave me alone right now. I got to read this Bible. I got to, I got to, I got to do my quiet time. Just, just leave me alone right now. It's like, why don't we do this together? Because that's the whole point: is that we do this together. And instead of falling in love, we turn the love of God into a job. We make it, we make it a problem, and and uh, we we need not to do that. So anyway, let me just let me just talk about this. So there's two ways to live. Basically, we're going to go into our message. There's God's way to live. And God's way to live is 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and we, we rely on the love, of, the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in, in him. Giving yourself to the love of God is the beautiful life. Giving yourself to the love of God is what everyone dreams of, is what we want. Okay, love moves us beyond the motive of personal gain. Love moves us beyond the motive of personal gain, and we find life when we move beyond the the motive of personal gain. So when you're falling in love, you're not trying to you're not trying to get stuff for yourself. You're just trying to fall in love. You're you're interested in the person, and it moves you beyond the motive of personal gain, and you find life. Matthew 16, 25. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. You give your life to me and you'll find it. I believe that God gives a prophetic revelation of himself to every human being, saved or lost, doesn't matter. Because falling in love, 
falling in love that people do, and, and it's worldwide, reveals the pleasure of surrendering your life to another person. You just drove 15 hours to spend one hour this person, and then you drove 15 hours back. Are you insane? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm insane. I'm totally insane. Because <laughs> you're in love. You're madly in love. It's a prophetic act that people realize that, wow, I experience life when I give myself to this person. And I don't know how long or short it lasts, but it's a prophetic act. It's a prophetic symbol from God that when you give yourself up in love, you find life. Because this is like, I'm crazy. I've never felt this way before. I got to write songs. I got to write cards. I got to write poetry. <laughs> because I've never felt this way before. And it's amazing. Young men are taken by surprise by their complete willingness to change everything. <laughs> they say, we had guy, friends that would say this, bachelor to the rapture. <laughs> That's what they would say. And then all of a sudden, they're enamored 24-7 by this girl. How did this happen? I was going to be bachelor to the rapture. They were taken. They were taken by love. Okay? So when we live in love, we find life. And it's amazing. The only question that matters at the end of all things is this. Did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Bob Jones said this. There is only one question the Lord will ask you when you stand before him in death. This is, he wrote this after he came back from death, by the way. He died, then he came back. And he wrote this. There's only one question the Lord will ask you when you stand before him in death. Did you learn to love? All the foundations of God are built on love. If you've learned to love, then you have obeyed everything God wants you to do. Love is our greatest pleasure. When you are in love with Jesus, he becomes your greatest pleasure. Living this love is the opposite of being self-centered. Philippians 2.2 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So he's talking about love. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So living in this love is the opposite of being a self-centered person. Okay. Cool? You good with love? I love love. How many love love? Yay. You know Dante's seven levels of hell? You know what the last level? I mean, I'm just throwing this out because I just... The last level of hell is to hate love. And that's where Satan is. Right, anyway, isn't it? I, uh, what? I don't know why I even go there. <laughs> Nobody needs to go there. Nobody go to hell. It's not necessary. Let's just love the Lord. Amen. Okay, good. We're all on the same page. Okay, there's another way. There's another way to live. Not in love, but is self-seeking. The way to live is self-seeking. Satan is a prime example of living a self-seeking life. And I want to compare these two things. I want them to be in our head because we're going to judge our heart in a minute. Isaiah 14, 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. These words are the exact opposite of how love talks. Love says, I just want to be with you, no matter what my gain. Instead, what can I gain from this relationship? What can I get out of this relationship? You want to be my friend? What can I get out of this relationship? How will this promote me? That is selfish ambition. That's selfish ambition in a relationship. How am I going to get, what am I going to get from this? What am I going to get? Okay. Whenever selfish gain motivates us, listen, church, Whenever selfish gain motivates us, we live in a losing principle the same as Satan. Anytime selfish ambition motivates a relationship, you're living in a principle of Satan. 
It's very, very unhealthy. So we need to know our own heart. If you were living in a death trap, would you want to know it? If you had a death trap in you and you were courting selfish ambition in some of your relationships, wouldn't you want to know it? Matthew 7, 27, and the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great and complete was its fall. That's Matthew 7, 27. Here is, here is madness if you're talking to a real estate agent about a house. This house may kill you, but you're going to love the view. <laughs> Yet I think we actually do this with our own soul. I have selfish ambition, but at least I'm feeling good about myself. Whoa, that's exact statement is saying, this house can kill you. Well, probably kill you. It'll fall down and smash you. But look at this view. It's going to be beautiful. You're going to enjoy it. I may have selfish ambition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't talk to me really about that. I know it's probably bad. I have selfish ambition, trying to get things from relationships, trying to pull things. I don't really care about the other person. I'm really looking out for number one. But at least I'm feeling good about myself. So I'm okay. Okay, that's madness. That is madness. That is madness, right? There's a full disclosure law that you need to apply to yourself as well as to real estate transaction. The law requires a complete exposure of every material fact to make an informed decision. And we need to do that with our own heart by saying Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because we need to know, am I living in poison? Right? We don't want poison. It's no good. So we must ask ourselves, what's in my heart? Um, so let's look at what proves our relationships. Let's look at what can prove that our, your relationship exists past selfish ambition. Okay? I have a little illustration, a little story to tell you. So let's say it was a broadcast fact that everyone who finishes a long journey gets a million dollars. See, I, you know, we announce it in here. Everyone who finishes a long journey is getting a million dollars. Which way you guys want to go? This way or this way? Uh, we go this north or south? Okay, we're going to go north. So everyone who goes north, we're going to travel, and uh, you all get a million dollars. On the way, because this, this announcement has been made to everybody, on the way, you make a lot of dear friends and acquaintances, right? It's like, hey, we're walking on the same path. Hey, this is great. We're having a party, right? And, and so you're making a lot of friends. You guys with me in this illustration? Okay, you clicking? Okay. Are you friend, You see your friends? Are they good looking? Are they happy? They're, they're fun? Okay. So the question is, you're walking along with all this group of people, and you're getting to know them. You're having dinner with them, you know, uh, having rest breaks with them and everything. The question is, is it love? Is it love between you and those other people? You can't know. They don't know. You don't know is the truth. You do not know. Only when a relationship is tested is the principle motivating the relationship revealed. So, you're walking along. Okay, you guys good? You don't know if they're friends or not or if there's love in there. So, you're walking along. You fall down a ditch and you seriously injure yourself. You wake up in the hospital. Your prize money is gone. You can't make the journey. Then, you see next to your bed a new friend, somebody that you kind of, you know, got close to on the trip. The friend says, I chose to stay with you no matter what it cost me. That proves love. You didn't know about anybody else, but this one situation, this one person, you guys hearing me? Yeah. They gave up personal gain to keep the relationship with you. That proves love. And everyone said, hallelujah. Oh, wrong thing. Hallelujah is what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Only then do you realize this relationship is something special. Choosing the relationship over personal gain proves love. God's love for us has no personal payoff for, for God. Jesus displays this love. John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He now showed them the full extent of his love. This was, this was earlier in the day that Jesus paid for salvation. This was the day that Jesus paid for salvation for everyone just so we could be together. 
So he showed the full extent of his love to, by giving up everything just to be with us. His priority was to be with us, not to have a gain, not to gain anything, but just to be with us. He gave up everything to be with us. This is proving love. This proves love. When we respond to God with this same level of love, where I just want to be with you, where we sing the song and it really means something to us. I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't know me, owe me anything. More than anything that you can do, I just want you. This is an expression of real love. I'm not here for you, for what you can give me. I'm not here for riches. I'm here just to be with you, just to know you, because you are my treasure. And when we respond to God with the same kind of love, God goes crazy nuts. It's right here in the notes. Crazy nuts. I mean, I, it's like, is that true? And then I looked at my notes. Yeah. He goes crazy nuts. So it must be true. 1 Peter 1.8. The Lord, whom having not seen you love. Wait a minute. Oh, the Lord. This is 1.8. Let's look at it. The Lord, whom you having not seen, but you still love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Kind of a, kind of a clumsy translation. But we love God even though we didn't see him. And we believe God even though we don't see him. That's what it's saying. And in loving God, even though we don't see him, we enter into something. We enter into some overwhelming feelings. And that's what I'm going to show you. We rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I want to say this, that when we love God in this way that I'm talking about, which he's saying in the first thing, we haven't seen him, but we love him. Then we enter into something. And this something is inexpressible joy and full of glory. This didn't, this didn't come from you. You're entering into something that's flowing from God. It's God's, God's the one that has this inexpressible joy, full of glory, and you're entering into it because you're responding to him with love. That's what I'm trying to get out of that verse there. We love, we enter into something, some overwhelming feelings. These come from God. It's like stepping into a waterfall. You're experiencing the flow of it. You're not making the flow of it. You're stepping into inexpressible joy, full of glory. You're not the source of that thing. That thing's flowing over you because that's how God's responding to your love. That's what I'm trying to see in that. He says this. He said, God says, everything is mine, but what I really treasure is people who respond back to my love. And he says it in Exodus 19, 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. You're responding back to me. You're responding back to me. And out of all Everything, you're my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. That's what's cool. Hey, man, everything's mine. But you know what's treasured to me? You guys that are responding back to me. That's what's a treasure to me. That's powerful. I want to say this. Job's life was a glowing tribute of living in and by God's love. In Job 1.8, we see a proud father. I, 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 please, just, just hold on to this, uh, this image of what's going on. There is a proud father speaking in Job 1.8. And he's saying this, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. He is broadcasting to Satan and the whole universe to look at Job. Why? Because it makes him crazy in love, inexpressible joy that, that Job is just serving God. And he's loving God back. This is, makes God go crazy. He loves it. This is, what he does, this is what he built the whole universe for, is to make love happen. And here's Job. Look, everybody. Job, he loves me. He loves me. Satan disagrees with God. Okay? And Satan's response is in Job 1.9. And Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. 
Here is Satan. Listen, listen, listen. Whoa, I'm going to have to stand right up here. <laughs> Just for a minute. That's too high. <laughs> here is Satan's uh, defense, his, his objection. Immediately comes back and says, this is not love. This is not love. Job is just seeking personal gain just like I do, says Satan. He's seeking personal gain just like me. Nothing more. That was his whole objection. He said, hey, what are you talking about? He, he, you made him rich. You protected him. That's why he's serving you. And that's what Satan's saying. He doesn't love you. He's just seeking personal gain just like I am because I'm living on personal gain. This is my motto of life, personal gain. Everything's for me. And that's what Job's doing. You bless the work of his hands. Stretch out your hand and strike everything he has. He will curse you to your face. Because he's just self-centered, just like I am. These humans can't love. Here's Satan's, here's Satan's charge. These humans cannot love you. This love you talk about is just an illusion. It's an illusion in mighty Jehovah's mind. It doesn't, happen, it doesn't occur with humans. You are deceived, God, says Satan. There's no real love here. You guys getting this? Yes, sir. Because, because, wow, this, this is a huge meaning for us and for what's going on in your life. Instead of blowing Satan away, instead of, I, I don't like that. Instead of blowing Satan away, God tests, he tests this objection in the face of, of the accuser exactly as it's presented by Satan. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Why, 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 why? Why? Here's why. When I say I love you, I might actually mean I love me. Question is, am I learning to love? And in fact, I can't tell the difference. Peter's a perfect example. He said... Matthew 26, 33, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will, Lord. I tell you the truth. Jesus answered. And then Jesus answered. He said, listen, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. The testing, Peter said, no, 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 I would never. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And Jesus said, you don't know what's in your heart. You really don't know what love is. The testing of Peter's love allowed Peter to make a turn. I just want to say, the testing of Peter's love allowed Peter to make a turn, allowed Peter to really have love be uh, cured in him. But I have prayed for you, Luke twenty two thirty two. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. All right? There is a temporary process that God puts us through where love and devotion can be proved and refined, where you really can have this love that's more valuable than gold. This is, this is the, the element God's looking all over the earth to find is this love. 1 Peter 1, 6, now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These may have come, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This testing of our faith does something. It's, it's refining something in you. You said, I would never, I would never uh, deny you, Jesus. And it's the test that, goes through, that, that causes me to make a turn and say, yes, I give everything to you. When Peter came back and made that statement of love again, he had been refined. And it was, it was more genuine. You, the love itself was more genuine. You guys cool with that? When I first told Tammy, I love you, how many years ago? A lot of years. 41 years ago. I suspected it was true, but I was a child. They let children get married. They used to. Not anymore now. Everyone's sold. So I, I, I told her I love you, but after 40 years of holding each other through every crazy event, love is proven in a greater way to both of us. 
Job held on to God even when there seemed to be no chance of a personal payoff. In Job 13, 15, it said this, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in God. No chance of a personal payoff did it seem like. He was just saying, I, I'm, I'm choosing you, God. I don't understand. I'm choosing you. Job's selfless devotion is so precious to God, it's forever documented in his book for every Christian to see throughout history that Job would not, would not count his own life. His wife himself said, just curse God and die. He didn't count his goods or anything as... as more important is his relationship with God. He never repented from that. I love you. I hang on to you. Though you slay me, I will, I will hope in you. And that's powerful to God. This same boasting, this is, this is where it comes straight to your living room. This same boasting is happening in heaven about you right now. Between you and, the, and all the courts of heaven. Luke 12, 8. I know this is true because Luke 12, 8 says, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. So there's this thing happening where he's, he's boasting of your commitment, of your love. Okay? And so the words of Job 1, 8, and 9 are being spoken about you right now. So this is... This is, I'm going to reread Job 1, 8 and 9. This is the PBGV version. Pa Pastor Bob Grenneman version. <laughs> Did you guys put this up? It was in blue, so you weren't supposed to. <laughs> I don't want to get struck by lightning. <laughs> Paraphrase. So, this is what I believe is happening over you right now in heaven. The Lord says to everyone in the universe, look, I, I get great glory and joy from that amazing person right there. That one really loves me. We have a real close relationship and it, it blesses me so much. They love me. And then Satan says, does that loser follow you for nothing? That person's just chasing the payoff. They know you said you'd make them healthy and, and wealthy. Prosper and be in health. They're just coming. All they're doing, they pretend to worship. They do this, that. They're just hoping that they're going to get a payoff. Maybe in ministry or something like that. That's all this. This is Satan's reply to God. Come on, you guys hearing this? This is exactly what he did with Job. So this conversation is happening over you. That loser follow, doesn't follow you for nothing. They're just chasing the payoff. They just want the reward and nothing else. That's what's in my heart and that's what's in their heart. But the fact is, is that no matter what we go through, I choose you, Lord. Because every time you make that declaration, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I, I lose it all, it doesn't work out. I, I choose you, Lord, I choose you, Lord, I choose you, Lord. That glorifies God like crazy. That gives inexpressible joy to the Lord. And it shuts Satan's mouth because he doesn't believe humans have the capacity to love God in return. He doesn't believe any created thing has the capacity to really enter into the love of God because he's not living there. It's totally out of his mind that it can even happen. That's why we are a mystery to Satan because we love the Lord with all of our heart. Even when the promised things don't seem to work out, even when things are complicated and difficult, and we get sick and our friends, our friends get in trouble and die or whatever. We still love God. I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand, but I love you. I love you. I choose you. That is the glory of God. In spite of the continual resistance, we say, I love you, Lord, no matter what. When your heart settles the love question, when your heart settles this love question, so I don't care what happens either way. Prosperity, sickness, whatever, 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 I'm going to love God. That's beyond any, that's beyond any circumstance because it's not the reward. It's that I know he's love and, and I found pure love. I found pure love and it's you. I'm going to go on the date and I'm not going to be all overwhelmed by the menu. I'm just going to say, I'm here for you. Maybe you can help me understand the menu. And you'll be like, yeah, that's the whole point. 
so good. When your heart settles the love question, your life is filled with fullness. It's actually in the Bible. Your life is filled with fullness. Ephesians 3.17 says it. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This love question fills our life with the fullness of God. It's the, it's the thing that God's looking for. Make God himself your treasure. Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Here's the conclusion. You find the purpose of life when you say, I love you more than anything, God. This also shuts Satan's mouth. It proves love and it blesses God exceedingly. Exceedingly. It's what he's looking for. It's what he's searching for. Praise God.